Scientists have been conducting animal testing and medical research for nearly two centuries, during which over hundreds of millions of animals have been used. We've all heard of Skinner's research on pigeons and Pavlov's dog study, but those are quite rare. Most often the animals tested are mice or rats, who've played a major role in medical research that had a huge impact on almost all areas of our lives medicines, cosmetics, cleaning detergents, food supplements, and more. But why out of all the animals has the medical community focused on one kind? And why mice specifically? After all, you'd think we could get more reliable information from animals that are more similar to us, like other mammals or monkeys, for example. And is it even possible to extrapolate directly from the behavior of one animal to that of another? Is it correct to conclude that dogs behave in a certain way just because cats or monkeys behave the same? Hmm, I don't think so. So if we agree that what applies to a cat doesn't necessarily apply to a dog, is it even possible to infer anything about humans from research done on mice? To me, it sounds a little far-fetched, so I decided to check and discovered some interesting things. In case you were wondering, the reason we use mice is not scientific at all. When researchers first began to use animals in their biological experiments, they sought the most viable animal, the one that's easiest to catch and keep. And obviously the answer was mice. Mice are cheap, you can get large quantities at a fairly low price, and they breed quickly. They eat everything, you can feed them your scraps left over from lunch, so it really doesn't cost much to take care of them. They are small, and thus require little lab space to accommodate them. Researchers can house them in large quantities in small cages inside the labs. They are easy to raise, and they adapt quickly to new environments. Sounds like the perfect animal for research, doesn't it? Subsequently, scientists began using mice in their studies. Over time, more and more knowledge about mice was compiled, and methods and protocols for working with mice slowly developed the next generations of researchers wanted to base their studies on existing knowledge. So obviously instead of using another animal and starting from scratch, they'd rather take the same mouse on which professional literature already exists and continue their research from there. And thus formed this kind of cycle of dependence, which exists to this day. Gradually, mouse-based research evolved and expanded to the extent that now it is almost impossible to work with any other animal. We have an MRI system for mice, ultrasound, blood tests. In short, almost every test that exists for humans is available for mice as well. If a researcher needs a thousand mice of a certain weight, all he has to do is pick up the phone and ask. It's very convenient, available, and cheap. However, having almost all of our current studies based on mice has led to a real problem. It is impossible to use other animals without replacing the entire system. Occasionally testing is done on other animals, but the process is more complex and requires more permits and money. That's why it's pretty rare. The problem is that even though mice and humans are 99% genetically identical, a mouse is not merely a small human. There is still a fundamental difference between us and them, which causes various problems in research. The biggest problem begins at the level of the single cell, which is the most significant arena where diseases manifest. At this level, where drugs are supposed to target the diseases, there is a significant difference between us and mice. In the approval processes of new drugs, initial toxicity testing is always performed on mice. After that, it moves on to human testing. However, there are drugs that are known to be beneficial to humans while causing harm to certain animals, so therefore a drug with real potential might be ruled out, and we can't rely completely on experiments on mice for scientific inference regarding humans. When it comes to brain cells too, there are major gaps between the electrical activity of a nerve cell in the human brain compared to that in the brains of mice. The human cell is more efficient in transmitting electrical signals. This could, for example, complicate medical research where drugs meant to treat Alzheimer's or Parkinson's are tested on mice. All agencies use data from mouse-based research in order to decide whether to develop a drug any further. If a drug does not work on mice, it never advances, even though there's a reasonable chance it may work on humans. And inversely, what works on mice won't necessarily work on humans. 
In an extreme example from 2006, a new cancer drug was tested on mice and worked remarkably. But when the human subjects were injected with the same drug at a very low dose, all the volunteers suffered from a catastrophic medical reaction and had to be hospitalized in intensive care for several days. In addition, mice have lived for millions of years in a germ-infested environment. They are more resistant to infection than we are, as they have developed a better strategy for dealing with infection, and tolerate larger doses of bacteria without causing the same inflammation we see in humans. Their immune system, metabolism, and stress levels also behave differently from us at the genetic level. In addition, mice and rats are nocturnal animals, while humans are diurnal. This poses a problem in studies on sleep and vision. And since mice don't see colors the way we do, and their vision is impaired, it is better to work with animals that are active during the day, like squirrels, whose vision is more similar to ours. Seasonal depression occurs when the amount of daytime hours decreases. It happens in countries where the days are very short in wintertime. There is no model for seasonal depression in mice, because they're nocturnal. If we reduce their daytime hours, we actually improve their conditions and prevent them from experiencing depression. In contrast, if we take Samamis or other diurnal species and reduce their daylight hours, we'll see depression-like behavior. This disease is very difficult to understand and treat since we don't have a suitable animal to model or test. And in general, psychiatric disorders are a subjective human experience caused by genetic, social, and environmental factors alike, as well as many other parameters that are impossible to study through animals. Research on decision-making is problematic too. What kind of decisions does a mouse in a cage have to make? Is the decision whether to take path A or B similar to all the psychological complications we humans face? They also don't choose a mate, neither in the cages nor in nature. They mate with whoever they meet. Also, the male does not play any role in raising the offspring or have a relationship with the female. Swallows, on the other hand, form lifelong bonds, so why not study swallows in a relationship study? And there are many other differences. In fact, from all the clinical trials based on mice, in over 80% of cases, the results end up not applying to humans. That's a lot of money and time wasted. So why not select a specific animal which is similar to us in a certain way for each particular study? It's problematic because if we wanted to study squirrels, for example, it would be impossible to get them inside university campuses. They couldn't get permits to keep wild animals. The whole issue of ethics also comes into play, such as animal rights, preservation of wildlife, and more. So why do we still waste precious resources and time studying mice, which entails the suffering of millions of mice a year and the loss of billions of dollars? Well, I found an answer to that, too. First of all, we currently have no other option, and if there is an alternative, it can pose a lot of problems. For example, there are some experiments done on rhesus monkeys, especially when studying parts of the human nervous system which is not like mice or rodents. Indeed, monkeys' nervous systems are more similar to ours. Another example is the study of parenting deficits, in which monkeys are separated from their mothers. This invokes strong objections from the public and animal rights organizations. Such ethical objections arise more the greater the resemblances between the animal used in the experiment and humans. So even when on purely scientific grounds it is preferable to work with a human-like model organism, practical considerations force us to test on smaller and more different animals. For this reason, mice are preferred over dogs, dogs over monkeys, and monkeys over apes. Nevertheless, let's not start to assume that every single study ever done on mice is invalid. We are still similar enough to trust these experiments. Mice still play a critical role in the development of new medical marvels, and they have some benefits. Mice are easily genetically customizable. We can modify and manipulate their genetic material with great ease. Researchers can get any model of mouse they want. They have a short lifespan and are therefore particularly useful in medical studies that rely on observing several generations of an animal, such as anti-aging research. Almost all human genes associated with diseases are common to rats as well. They have diseases similar to ours, like cancer, diabetes, etc. This has helped a lot of scientists to develop drugs against common human illnesses. 
we know how to work with mice. Researchers have worked over the years on amazing genetic and molecular breakthroughs that enable innovative experiments on mice. They are well acquainted with the genome of the mouse and know how to manipulate it in order to research and develop drugs. Mice can really help a scientist find out if a drug has true potential. And in general, the problem is not limited to mice. No matter what animal we use in our experiments, there is no test that is guaranteed to be successful, because the only animal with all the right cells and proteins that can perfectly predict what happens in the human body are us humans. We still need animal testing. We still need their help to cure people, advance science, save human lives, and alleviate suffering. If it is any consolation, researchers who run experiments on animals make an effort to prevent unnecessary suffering. Usually animals who recover from an experiment or surgery endow them with a treatment that prevents pain. Also, if an animal suffers from chronic bleeding or damage or deformity that cannot be treated after an experiment, it will be euthanized to prevent needless suffering. It is important to remember that these studies benefit not just us humans, but also animals themselves. A lot of animals suffer from the same diseases as humans, so the drugs can benefit them too. There will be no new drugs if we stop such experiments, so for now, we have no other choice. Mankind has made incredible medical achievements thanks to these experiments. For the past 40 years, all Nobel Prize winners in physiology or medicine have based their research on animal testing, including the vaccines for polio and measles, organ transplantation, and more. Actually, the first tests on kidney transplantation were performed on animals. Just imagine how much suffering has been avoided because of the advanced medicine we now have, thanks to such testing. If you like this video, please share it with your friends. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you and stay tuned.